Okay. Um, looks like I see everybody. Great. So today is Monday, April 3rd. I'm going to call the City Council Committee on City Services to order. Um, first, a quick announcement that this meeting and all who are on it are being audio and video recorded. Uh, you've got that going, right, Laura? Okay. Laura, would you call the roll, please? Uh, Councillor Foster. Here. Councillor Gore. Here. Councillor Labarge. Here. Councillor Terry. Here. Councillor, you have a quorum. Okay, great. Thank you. Councillor. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Councillor. I'm ha I just had a problem listening to Laura. Like she sounded far away. You know, I've noticed that with this computer when I've used it before, it's had the same. I don't know where the microphone is. It's a little, yeah. Uh, I'm bringing it closer. That's better. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And, and speak up if you, if you can't hear. I'm happy to relay too. Okay. Um, next up on the agenda, item three is public comment. Um, I wasn't sure what that would look like. There's only um, a few members of the public here. So I'm going to go ahead and open it up to public comment. Um, if you would like to make a public comment, you can use the reactions feature to raise your virtual hand um, and I'll call on anyone who would wish to be spoke to speak. Okay, seeing none, um, we'll move on to item four, the minutes of previous meetings. And I just wanted to check with other committee members. Did you get a chance to review the January 3rd and February 6th minutes? Laura sent them out um, this morning um, and like around noon. So I just wanted to check in with you. I read them. You did, okay. I read them. All right. Okay. Oh, so, is Yes, I, I did. Okay. Excellent, okay. Um, then um, if there could be a motion um, to approve the minutes. Yes, I'd make a motion to approve the minutes of January 3rd, 2023 and February 6th, 2023 as a group. I'll okay. second. Great, thank you. Um, oh, Councilor Gore. I have to abstain from January 3rd, but I want to vote on February 6th. Thank you. So we'll separate those out. Um, so we'll, I like the group idea, Councilor Labarge, but we'll we'll do two separate votes. Thanks, yeah. Councilor. Yeah. We'll um, okay. So could you remake your motion? Because you would move them as a group. Could you remake that motion? Yes, um, I'll, I'll remake that motion. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes of, well, we can't, because she can't vote on this one. We have a quorum though, so we okay. could do January 3rd and then separately February 6th. Okay, so I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes of January 3rd and February 6th, 2023. Sorry, Councilor, can you make it for just January 3rd to start? Just for January 3rd? Yeah. But well, that's what I asked. <laughs> Sorry, I misunderstood. So we can, okay. we just like need to, to approve them separately. To approve the minutes for January 3rd, 2023. I will second that. Thank okay. You. <laughs> Thank you. After a lengthy process, Councilor Lavarge uh, made the motion. Councilor Perry seconded. Laura, can you do a roll call? Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Gore. Epstein. I thought it was the second one, sorry. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Perry. Yes. Okay, so that passes three to nothing. And then next up. I will make a motion to approve the minutes of um, February 6th, 2023. I'll second that. Okay, thank you. So motion made by Councillor Perry, seconded by Councillor Labarge. Laura, can you do a roll call on that one? Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. And Councilor Perry. Yes. Thank you. So the motion to approve the minutes of the February 6, 2023 meeting passes four to nothing. Um, which brings us to item five on the agenda, which has um, been looking forward to for quite a while. So um, that is an update on the Department of Community Care uh, from, I'm, I'm not sure on language here, you'll tell me, I didn't know if it should be Division of Community Care from the Department of Health and Human Services. And um, I see we have a number of you. Um, so I will let you actually go ahead and tell me 
how you would like to do this. And, and Mayor, I see you here too. I didn't know if you wanted to make an introduction. Uh, you know, I'm just really here to support and just be so happy to, to be in this space with, with Commissioner O'Leary and Deputy Commissioner Ferry and the new director of the Division of Community Care, um, Kristen Rhodes. So um, I'm very excited for um, for you to meet her and to have this update. And so that's that's just why I'm here is to, to be here in, in sort of support and celebration with you all. Wonderful. And full disclosure, in this very small valley in which we live, Kristen and I have actually collaborated um, in the past. And so I am not meeting Kristen tonight, but I'm meeting her in a new role. And I'm excited for that. Um, so um, it, however you all wanted to take this, I'm happy to follow your lead. Um, can you make Meredith a co-host, please, Laura? Or it will be a very long meeting for Commissioner O'Leary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if we could have share slides, if you could allow Kristen to share her screen, that would be fantastic. Okay, so if we could make Kristen a co-host and probably Michelle while we're at it. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Laura. So hello everyone. Thank you, counselors, for inviting us here today um, to talk about, excuse me, I have a very needy dog and I apologize beforehand. <laughs> I'll try to keep them under control. So thank you for uh, inviting us all today to talk about the good work that's been happening in the Division of Community Care. And you actually you had the uh, language perfect. It's the Department of Health and Human Services with the Division of Community Care. Today is a very special day to be have been asked to come here and present as it's the first day of National Public Health Week. And this year's theme is centering and celebrating cultures and health, whereby working together, we can reimagine the public health paradigm that promotes equitable health for all. So I think this is perfect timing. So just to recap um, to the counselors, I know you all know this, but there might be some public on tonight that doesn't know how we got here. So I'm just gonna give a little bit of history and then I'm going to hand the virtual mic over. So as you may or may not know, last May by administrative order, the mayor amended the City of Northampton Administrative Code to establish the Department, Health, the Department of Health and Human Services under a health commissioner, whereas the department is responsible for protecting, preserving, and promoting the health and well-being of the city's residents, particularly the most vulnerable. vulnerable. Also by administrative order, the mayor established that there will be a community care division under the DHHS, where the Department of Community Care is a public health led integration of Northampton's public safety systems, a non police based response and is focused on addressing racial and social inequities and supporting our community, <laughs> our community members during times of significant challenges related to emotional distress, substance use, houselessness, meeting of people's basic, need, basic needs, navigating conflicts, and other unexpected crises. Inclusion in the city's Department of Health and Human Service not only gave implementation director at that time, Sean Donovan, a team to help support his work and vision, but also gives the DCC a home that includes a more robust administrative and organizational support. Um, with a department that has a proven record at the intersections of public health and public safety with programs such as DART, Hampshire Hope, Northampton Prevention Coalition, and other initiatives that have been resources both locally and regionally to expand harm reduction services and to aid police in non-enforcement uh, responses to substance use. The Department of Health and Human Services had a vision for the DCC um, innovation that demonstrates the known values for directly addressing the social determinants of health, racism, and racism as a public health emergency, an incredible way that can leverage the strengths of public health and public safety collaborations. How we measure success is not by how many less calls that have been diverted from the Northampton Police Department, but actually it's how we affect change and outcomes. Sean was the department of uh, was with the Department of Health and Human Services for just about six months, where much of his work uh, around community assessment, discovery, and relationship building has laid a nice foundation for the continued the continued development of the DCC. 
Sean also helped to create a framework to the unfolding structure and training for a community responders role, which we'll talk a little bit more about when Kristen's up. With the absence of the uh, DCC director for the last four months, I still want to assure you that work has been ongoing and continuing with the brunt of the lift being carried by our DHHS Deputy Commissioner, Michelle Fari. Today, you'll hear both from Michelle and Kristen about our DCC's mission, work plan, strategic, logic model, and vision for the future. But before I hand over the mic, I'd like to formally introduce Kristen to council and public. Kristen Rhodes was hired as our Division of Community Care Director, whose official first day was three weeks ago, March 13th. So congratulations, Kristen. We are happy to have you on <laughs> our team. Kristen uh, received her Master of Ed from Springfield College in Therapeutic Recreation Management and a BA from UMass Amherst in Sociology with a concentration in Social Services and a minor in Education and Psychology. Kristen has directed, taught, and provided programming for children and adult disability services for nonprofit organizations, charter schools, public schools, and the state of Massachusetts. She's been a special education teacher and administrator with a focus of therapeutic teacher in social, emotional, and behavioral classrooms, and has directed programs for adults with disabilities and community-based programs and day habilitation programs. Throughout her work, her focus has been providing person-centered therapeutic programs for marginalized populations and working to create equitable access to those, <clears throat> to those services and also providing information and support to families and caregivers. She has created and grown programs to meet the changing needs of those that are utilizing the services. Kristen also has a background and expertise in trauma-informed practices, program development, and management and program development. And most importantly, Kristen comes with an earnest belief in the mission of the Division of Community Care. So with that being said, no further ado, I'd like to hand this over to Kristen. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. I apologize, I just need to get my screen back up. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to... Um, begin to share a statement that we wrote in preparation for the anticipated equitable approaches to public health. We developed this description to describe our work. Um, the DCC had developed a mission statement. However, we're very excited to bring to our soon to be formed community advisory group this statement to finalize together. We value the community and the people's voice to guide us as we determine our scope of work and how we describe the work we do. Here is the statement. The City of Northampton and the City of Northampton's Health Department in partnership with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health are developing a new division, the Division of Community Care, DCC. The DCC is focused on addressing racial and social inequities and supporting our community members during times of significant changes related to emotional distress, substance use, homelessness, and meeting and meeting of their basic needs, navigating conflict and other unexpected crises. The DCC is a public health led integration of Northampton's public safety systems and non-police based response. The DCC model includes specialized, highly skilled and trained community care response team, CCRT, as a third tier to non-emergency and emergency needs responses. The DCC at its, at its inception is an innovative model that incorporates a variety of equitable, diverse responses for all people while centering its most vulnerable community members with supportive trauma-informed practices, embracing of peer support philosophies, and responding when people experience struggles throughout the community landscape. As a new employment role in the city's staffing infrastructure, the DCC will carry out this mission by valuing people with lived and living experiences, integration of preventative strategies, harm reduction practices, provider of public education opportunities, and serve, I'm sorry, and serve our wider community in a wide array of peer-to-peer -peer support practices. I'm going to hand it over to 
Deputy Commissioner Fari for um, an explanation of our community care response team. Thank you, Kristen. I know that was a lot of words on that slide. Um, I am so thankful and grateful to be here with you all tonight. I was looking forward to this so much um, and I just couldn't wait to talk about the DCC with you all. So much has been happening. But this slide here is really giving you some of the precipice of what the community care response team might do and some of the activities that they might take on as part of their daily role. Part of what we can't be specific about right now with you is exactly what that role will look like and exactly what the call types might be that we would be responding to. And I can give you some very good reasons why. First is that we are doing a very extensive data analysis right now of three years of dispatch data that was provided in cooperation with the Northampton Police Department and our city IT that did a wonderful job putting together a very significant amount of qualitative and quantitative data that's being assessed by the Law Enforcement Action Partnership known as LEAP. Second to that, we're also engaging with the community through listening sessions that have been happening by an expert provider that is one of those people within Massachusetts that has accolades for working with BSAS and other state level organizations and acquiring community voice. The all, the whole structure around um, creating the community listening sessions has been designed to do as a group or individualized one-on-one -on -one, and as well through phone and in-person sessions. And we can happily um, report that not only was every spot filled, we did have overflow and additional spots where we met with people individually, met with people at MANA, met with some stakeholders as well. And we're having all of those um, interviews transcribed right now so that we can also code those and compare those with some of the data. And on a third tier of um, very important information, we're also gathering by community stakeholders, which we call key informant interviews. That is a very unique combination of people who've been part of the development of the DCC since the Northampton Policing Review Commission from all different stakes um, and leadership, and then as well, community organizations and our systems partners. And we're doing these interviews by um, UMass being a research partner that's also going to be documenting the process for Northampton. And what's really exciting about that is by trying to accomplish two goals um, at once, we're not only gathering all of this information to inform the work that we plan for the DCC in our daily activities and identifying critical needs where we can make some headway and provide infrastructure support right off the bat. But we're also going to be documenting this work and a significant report that's going to be produced, as well as research that's being done through an IRB study that UMass um, has been partnered to uh, the work on, that we can document this for the city of Northampton. We can document our process, our lessons learned, and we can share with many other communities that look to uh, create something like the DCC and how we can do that with a public health framework and a public health reflective approach. So this is a few of the broad strokes at what we might expect the community responders to do, but we're going to be very excited to report back, probably I'm guessing in about two months with all of those pieces of data put together and um, some very defined phases of implementation. I think you're going to take the next slide, Kristen. Thank you. Um, so next, I wanted to speak a little bit about um, the training we have scheduled um, for our community response team. Um, we have an incredible group of organizations and people who will be providing training for our responders and our DCC team. And we will be providing over 150 hours of specialized training for our community care responders. Um, this is a list of just some of our training organizations um, and some example of these trainings will be working with human in common to provide equity, diversity and inclusion trainings, working with Wildflower Alliance to provide peer support and harm reduction trainings, as well as non clinical and dialogue based support strategies. Um, Growing a new heart will provide a series of training 
and consultation on compassionate, accountable dialogue case interventions with community members. Community 911 will provide a mandatory training for all first responders in Massachusetts to ensure our staff are ready to assess any immediate medical needs and also be able to provide first aid, which may allow for someone to receive care for minor injuries on site. And through these in many trainings, our CCRT will utilize trauma-informed practices, racially and culturally informed practices, peer supports, crisis response, collaborative problem solving, harm reduction practices, and of course, use our first responder training. These trainings were curated into this robust training series that will drive the work of our community care response team. The team will have training to enter a multitude of situations utilizing tools to best support an individual based on their own needs in their own situation. These trainings center the individual, teach how to respond both to a situ situation with professionalism and keeping safety as a priority while ensuring that the response is culturally minded, trauma informed and a collaborative process. We may make choices around the priorities of the trainings based on the needs and the data as Michelle spoke about and what we're seeing with the community throughout our rollout and phases. So this is not a static menu, um, but we'll be updating and changing and integrating based on the needs that we are seeing in our community. Our next slide is very exciting to talk about. Um, the DCC staff will be moving into our new location, um, which is the bottom floor of the Roundhouse building uh, mid to late April, so really soon. Um, the, space, the space was formerly the Smithsonian and that will be our community, community room and it will open for the public in July of 2023. Um, the community room will be staffed by our DCC coordinator and our community care response team. That community room will have a living room model of support, which will include immediate responses from our staff, a safe place to rest and relax, support from CCRT during difficult situations, linkage with referrals for needs such as housing, healthcare, food, and mental health services, identification and referral to community resources, access to our public health nurses. And we'll also hold CCRT community events, opportunities for learning, ongoing specialized trainings and group meetings. People will have access to resources and case management on a walk-in basis. And we'll also be the administrative hub for our offices. We'll be establishing hours of operation based off of, again, the data that um, we were discussing earlier that's currently being analyzed. Um, so that information will be coming soon. A lot of time and energy is being put into our community space using a trauma-informed lens. As community members may enter the space while experiencing a crisis, we want to create a space that will help with any de-escalation process that may need to occur. Our first step is to help someone feel safe. This can take time and differs from person to person. The staff of the community room will be trained in a multitude of techniques, and the first step of their process will be to see and hear the needs, which may be stated directly or shown through behavior and start the process of therapeutic de-escalation, which can mean many things depending on the community member's needs. It could mean time, a space, or someone to talk to. For this to occur in a shared space, there are many factors that need to be considered. Sensory friendly often refers to an environment which people are given the sensory input they need to self-regulate and decompress. Alternatively, it's an environment that lacks overstimulating sensory input. This can include a design such as lighting and the use of colors of the space. It can also include the energy a person feels when they walk in. When a person is entering our space, they'll be greeted by the coordinator or their community responder in an intentional trauma-informed greeting and an introduction to the space. We want everyone, whether they are in a crisis or not, to feel welcome and safe. This means having a calm and predictable environment 
with some semi-private areas that can be used if a person needs a different location when they're feeling overwhelmed. There'll be sensory items available for use along with cognitive distractions and strategy tools to also aid in de-escalation if needed. To encourage the building of relationships, the space will also have chairs, couches, and areas to foster community and relationships. Thank you, Kristen. I have to say for three weeks, she has been amazing and <laughs> just hit the ground running. Um, this is just a snapshot of what to expect later this week that's going to be going live, which is the new uh, Division of Community Care website. There'll be a hyperlink to it on the existing Division of Community Care page that's located under the Department of Health and Human Services that we have right now with an expanded version here on its own freestanding site to have many different access links to resources, a little bit about the division itself. We plan to have bios and a familiar connection to the different community responders as they are brought on board and hired. Um, we really want there to be an accessibility to this site with a lot of different thoughtfulness around how we're presenting our images, material, and language. And even as Kristen has been walking into the role in such a warm and embracing way, she's taking all of the images that we've procured for the DCC with captioning for them, making sure that we're really thinking about all people and how they may interact with our information, um, factored for health literacy, as well as vetted through several of our partner organizations for language, and also making sure that we're looking for every opportunity to promote the Division of Community Care is a very welcoming and warm, embracing place to come work with us in the coming weeks as we are going to be promoting of those new positions to be hired. So as we found through the process that once we put information out there that it takes a life of itself, we have put an incredible amount of diligence and thought into every word and crafting and thinking very strategically how we wanted to present the Division of Community Care as it went public, so to speak. So coinciding with the new space, which is a very, very significant um, move forward for us in our temporary location, we will accompany that with our website. There also will be a telephone number that we're going to be going live with, and that number will be a direct line for the community to the Division of Community Care that's HIPAA compliant and also is tech Textable. We have an independent free email that will be the Division of Community Cares that will be monitored by the coordinator so people can feel free not to be as attached to an individual, but attached to the DCC as a division, as a fully functional operating division. And we want to do that to create autonomy for the Division of Community Care, but also continue towards the new infrastructure of embedding it as a system of care. <clears throat> so the commissioner is always uh, giving me very good constructive feedback on refining the hundreds of things I wanted to put into this timeline. Um, and I can be a little extra sometimes with my words. So this is to keep me on track here. But I can tell you that there has been such a dynamic amount of daily tasks as well as short, you know, I would say medium and longer term goals, getting us all basically around to July has been really the laser vision. Um, we were so thrilled and very, very thankful to Senator Comerford and Rep Sabadosa for advocacy that was done on behalf of Northampton, which was not originally funded for the Equitable Approaches to Public Safety Grant. And some of us um, might be familiar with that funding that was awarded to Amherst for their CREST program. And unfortunately, in the first round, Northampton was not awarded the funding through a lot of um, advocacy and some provisions made and some late funding that was able to be allocated by the legislator. We found out on a Friday afternoon that uh, the DCC was going to be awarded funding for EAPS. So for all the planning and all the preparation and the maximizing of resources that we had put in place and managing to build something we thought was going to be phenomenal with the budget that we had, we now have this infusion of additional resources. The only 
somewhat hitch was that those resources needed to be maximized, budget approved, and spent all by the end of this municipal fiscal year, so by the end of June. So what we did was we really got to work in December, knowing this funding was going to be coming our way, and we took our plans and we added in the layer of what we were going to be working with to what we really wanted to be working with, and boy, was it amazing. I cannot tell you enough. Our partners knew by then from doing this work at DHHS where some of our gaps and resources were that we were able to immediately allocate funding towards. We were able to expand on some of the scopes of services for especially our research partners and people that were really working hard to gather our community voice. We were fortunate to have a contract signed in January with the Department of Public Health that approved our budget and expenditures. And I have to say a very big thank you to the mayor's office who turned some very fast paperwork timelines back around for us for DPH and it all came together beautifully. We were able to allocate all of that funding contract for all of the pieces of work that we could. This is how we were able to uh, get this interim space um, here in the former Smithsonian downstairs below the DHHS offices in one roundhouse. And it's been really a gift. Um, it's been wonderful because we have been able to take the resources and really think extremely strategically about what we could spend in the short term and what could really help us towards sustainability in the future. So one of those things uh, that we did do was revise what our plans were, and we were also actively looking for soliciting of a new director at that time, and we were able to post for the position. Um, we refined some of what we knew those tasks, skills, and the role would be, um, posted for that, and interviewed several candidates, and we're very pleased um, to bring Kristen on board. We've also been working really hard to develop the job descriptions for the community responders, CCRTs, and the DCC coordinator. There's a lot of C's in the DCC. Um, and we're very excited to have a signed offer letter for the new coordinator to be starting soon as well. So all of the pieces are coming together and this is the best spring ever for the DCC. We're so excited. It is definitely blooming. Kristen, you can advance the slide. So this is to give you a little bit about moving forward. And did you want me to do this one, Kristen, or did you want to take, you want me to take this one too? Okay, so one of the things that we're really excited about in the spring is we're going to be moving into our space. We're in April right now. So we're expecting sometime mid-April to start putting in some furniture, moving in some of our pieces, getting our offices organized and preparing for what we hope to be a bringing on board during May, probably I would say fully through May, the community responders themselves and getting engaged with our training right away as soon as possible. Other things that the DCC has been helping to facilitate is also across the city and a readiness for implementation is some diversity, equity, and inclusion training for the staff. And thinking about that, we wanted to make sure that when the DCC staff come on board that the city itself is starting to get ready and feels prepared and is aware of what kind of skills and role the DCC community responders are looking to foster, develop, and grow on behalf of the city's public safety systems. We're going to be doing a soft launch sometime in July, and what we're very excited about is a phased-in launch. By then, we'll have all of our feedback from our consultants. We'll have a lot of different deliverables that will be arriving, such as operations, policies, and procedures manuals that we've contracted with experts to help design. We'll have a little bit more clarity as far as what exactly the biggest needs are for us to start to tackle first. We want to have the community care responders out in the community and getting as visible as possible so that people can start talking with them, engaging with them, and letting them know what they think and feel on the ground. And then as we move forward, we hope July will be full of community events, trainings, a lot of engagement, fact finding, and really working out any of our, I would say, early kinks and refining of our system so that we can start to develop what our workflow will be and operationally getting everything put together for the day to day. What's really also very hopeful for us is that we're going to have a differentiation in some of our staffing of the community care responders. So defining of what those roles look like in day to day is also a lot of what we're looking forward to kind of teasing out in the structure internally. 
many things to come here with the timeline. <laughs> and again, very hard to pare down to a full few bullets. So this is just a very, very high level overview of um, just some of the activities that are happening within the DCC. But in summary, and I will turn it back over to Kristen, I can tell you that um, just recently having an experience of the network of a lot of our consultants from across the country, the few people who have done this and done this well, being in public health and starting a DCC by inception has been incredibly exciting. There's been some for sure challenges. And I think things that have really pushed us to make sure that we're developing something with diligence, with um, mitigating of any future potential harm in any way that we can to be trauma informed and inclusive it has been really wonderful to think on behalf of our city of Northampton, we are working with people that have done this in a lot of different landscapes and are sharing all of their lessons learned with us to help us avoid any of those um, missteps that other programs have experienced and we are gaining the benefit of. So thank you for this and getting a chance to share it with you and I look forward to your questions. And Kristen, did you wanna say anything to wrap us up, our commissioner? I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to meet you all um, and to be here tonight. Um, I am beyond excited for this division. And um, now that we're right on the, the point, the moment of bringing in our coordinator and um, we're going to be bringing in our community care response team soon. It's just really, really exciting to see everything moving while learning about all the work that has been done simultaneously. So it's been an amazing three weeks, um, but working with this team and hearing the voices of the community, just being so excited for this division, just um, brings me so much joy and excitement to be able to be in this role and to be a part of this team. So I'm really looking forward to the work ahead. Thank you, everyone. Um, what I'd like to do is turn this over um, to counselors for questions. Before I do, Mayor, did you have anything you wanted to add? I, I know you're here to support, but I just wanted to give you a chance. Um, not really, other than like, I, I hope you all see what I see, which is just a remarkable team. Um, and the the I'm just very proud of how thoughtfully and Carefully, we are building this division. I think that that's really critical for this work. And um, I know that things never move as quickly as people want them to, but I hope you can see all of the time and care, immense big brains and effort that um, have, have been working on this um, for, for uh, a bit over a year. Um, and then, you know, before then um, was Sean when he was in the mayor's office. And so, um, there's, there's a great deal of work and effort that's being put into this, and um, I'm extremely proud of it, and I'm extremely proud of this team. Thank you. Um, so we'll open it up to questions from counselors, and, and I'm going to go ahead and include in that counselors who are not on the City Services Committee, but I'll start with City Services Committee members. Um, so let's start with Councilor Labarge and then Councilor Gore. Thank you. Um, welcome to Northampton, Christian, and Congratulations on your new position as the new director of community care. I want to commend Meredith O'Leary, Michelle, and everybody who has worked so tirelessly, like the mayor has just stated. You can see the way you have worked tirelessly in the city, along with our mayor and her department, to put in place a well-organized agenda. I am very pleased with what I'm reading here tonight and hopefully we'll be able to see this whole set up again because there's a lot of information in there. I'd, I'd like to know who are some of the community stakeholders? Could, could Michelle, could you answer that? Sure. Please? Would you like to know that in um, respect to the community um, key informant interviews or in general stakeholders? In general. In general. Okay. Very good question, Councillor Labarge. And it's nice to see you. 
we are looking at not only our behavioral health, our social services, but also Cooley Dickinson, obviously our other public safety divisions. And then what's really interesting as well is we're able to grab some contextual knowledge from the senior center, from Forbes, from some of our faith-based partners. We've also included the voices of people within the DHHS, such as our inspectors, who often get a firsthand account when they're in people's homes relating to inspections or regulatory work. It's very, very, um, I would say, positive overall how many people can find connections to where the DCC can be a support, an ally, or a provider of education, collaborating on events. There is probably a lot more opportunity than we will be able to manage in some ways with stakeholders. So we're going to have to be very fair and very thoughtful on how um, we divide up the capacity. But the other area we're really interested in making sure that we build our stakeholder relationships with, which I will come naturally, is um, right on our Main Street area, thinking about our transportation providers, our business communities. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of different downtown business to the extended business districts, you know, all the way into Florence. So we have a lot of groundwork to do in building those relationships. And we want to do that by shaking hands, having conversations in person and really um, unveiling the DCC CCRT member, um, department members for that personal relationship and trust building. But I don't think there's any sector that you could name that I couldn't give you a good compelling argument we could intersect with as a stakeholder for the DCC. I, I understand that. Also to you're looking at hiring for staff, correct? What is going to be the hours of opening and closing. So Councilor Labarge, what we're imagining is we will be doing a rigorous amount of training during the early onboarding process that will follow predominantly the city schedule. So typical Monday through Friday, um, 8.30 to 4.30 to five somewhat hours. During that training and rigorous onboarding process, there'll also be a lot of interfacing with the community. Um, as events come up, time of year, season, and, and all of the activity that has happened in the busy um, springs pre-COVID um, in Northampton, we want to be out there as much as possible as well. So we'll continue to assess the capacity, we'll find out what our funding and infrastructure looks like from the state level awards and grants that are in the works right now. And depending on the scale and the way we feel we can do this work and do it well, mm -hmm. we will continue to expand in operation hours. Um, and we will make sure to keep everyone abreast of any sort of changes or expanding of hours in the future. Just seeing how you set up this whole mm -hmm. plan did not happen overnight. There's no question about it. <laughs> I can tell you the, the amount of thought uh, oh, and research okay. that's gone into it. But one, just this is an interesting fact, and it might not be relative to Northampton, and we'll see what the data presents. But when I had oh, gone to Portland um, with uh, Sean at the time, one of the things we found that was quite interesting when they did their full um, preparation and data analysis was when the community is awake, when businesses are open is often, believe it or not, the higher impact times um, when the call volumes are more significant. I agree. Where you see the challenge is over the nights and weekends when there's the bigger gap in systems of care. But we'll be assessing all of those things rigorously along with the city leadership. I was very happy also to see the amount of hours on training at 150 hours. I think that's extremely critical extremely critical with training. I mean, we have so many different types of disabilities in the community. And it's not easy. I've worked with different types of disabilities all my life. Mm -hmm. And it's something that you handle very gently, very gently. You know, so the training, I'm very happy to see that. And thank you very, very much, Christian for joining in with our mayor and city councilors and helping us make our city what we want it to be, is vibrant, equal, and give them a good quality of life. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Councilor Labarge, you're always so kind. Thank you so much. I just wanted to add, not only do we have these wonderful models in different parts of the state and other states that uh, Michelle and Sean looked at to uh, see where the the high volume of calls are coming in, but we also have, which uh, I don't know if Michelle or Kristen who mentioned it earlier on in the presentation, we have hired a consultant, a national consultant called LEAP, to analyze three years of calls coming into dispatch. And that there will tell us what our work plan looks like, what hours that we should have community responders um, you know, available. So I just wanted to provide that information. Yeah. So would there be like, all right, say during the day from 8.30 to 4.30 or whatever, and then there's a call. Will that call go directly to community care? Or how are you going to work this out between 911 and community care? If there is a problem, say, uh, Main Street, how do you subdivide those calls? That is a wonderful question. And I'm really glad you're asking something for that kind of detail. So when the DCC launches, we have a very small public information messaging campaign that's going to be going out along with it. And part of that is clarity. Firstly, in what the DCC is, what it does, when it's operating, and what we do not do. And the distinction around the DCC and what our public safety professionals do every day is to make sure people know to call 911 if there is an emergency. Every single message that comes um, as an engagement from community members will remind people if this is an emergency to call 911. And we will do everything during operating hours too as well, navigate and route people back to 911 services. But there will be a population of people that don't utilize the 911 system. We know this from our substance yeah. use work at DHHS and some of the fear around the Good Samaritan law and other things where DCC can help provide care for people that would not necessarily call 911 in any circumstance, let's say. And perhaps we can help facilitate or help give them a gap care a care gap warm hand off anything that we can do to help promote their health and wellness but their health and wellness being the priority what we anticipate initially is we'll be taking a uh, activity level that is training rigor and just to just to pause on that for one second counselor labarge you mentioned the amount of hours and what i wanted to tell you about that is we really anticipate the dcc CCRT is a workforce development effort. So we really need to take into consideration there's going to be people with all different kinds of skills, professional, non-professional backgrounds, and being equitable on the onboarding and training. And I wanted to make sure I did mention that piece. Where people will be able to reach us is by phone, walking into the community space, by email, or by text. If there is a need, we can respond when it's appropriate, not a 911 emergency, yes. and be able to start to mobilize in the phased in part of our work. So part of that is the community can request our support and services prior to any integration of dispatch to give us a chance to really um, meet the community level. Um, community members at highest risk. <laughs> Sorry, a little tongue tied tonight. <laughs> But um, last thing I wanted to tell you as part of that, and this wasn't included in our PowerPoint, but we just got our new strategic plan and logic model that we're reviewing right now mm -hmm. um, with our timeline. But we do also anticipate being able to make that a public document on the DCC website soon to come to with more mm -hmm. levels of detail. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Councilor Gore, you've waited incredibly patiently. Um, why don't you go ahead and then Councilor Perry, I see you after. Absolutely. Councilor Barge uh, asked my question. <laughs> I, <think laughs> I love that. Um, and uh, I just want to say welcome, Kristen, and uh, you guys are doing an amazing job rolling this out. Um, I had a question about listening sessions. Are there going to be any more? And I had a, another question about what are what are some of the other sources of funding that you guys are looking at? 
Well, I'm, I don't want to speak for Kristen, but I promised her I would, you know, help uh, support <laughs> where uh, some of the questions come in so she can as well take in um, as part of her process of learning. We do plan on having more community listening sessions. And actually, Kristen had a wonderful idea of offering um, tea time with herself and having open hours for anyone that would like to come in and share some feedback, talk about a personal experience with an open regular dialogue that's always available to people and rolling. Um, we as well included Kristen's contact information. I think that she would like nothing more than to talk to as many people as possible. So um, we'll have some organized opportunities, but also we are welcome um, to anyone who wants to reach out to us. And we do get a lot of emails from people. A lot of people do reach out and we're very excited when they do. Michelle, don't we have two dates coming up? We have just completed this past week our last two promoted um, and circulated listening sessions that are being coded. And part of it is sometimes you have to make a hard stop just so that we can get all that information together to make some good, important decisions. But we do anticipate to have a few more listening sessions after we get that information, maybe even dig a little bit deeper in probing questions of themes or things that we see come up. But Kristen, you have to promote your tea time now and come up with the day of the week and the time. Yeah, and I do plan to have them um, when I was um, thinking about the scheduling. I'm going to um, offer them out in the community, and I'm also going to offer some virtually with some daytime, some evening, and some weekend opportunities to try to bring as many voices as possible um, into the conversation. So I'm thinking at least three times a month they'll be um, structured, but on different days and times. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And yeah, my other question was about other sources of funding. Meredith, do you want me? Um, yeah. We're <laughs> so, yeah. So currently we have um, the EATS funding and we're hopeful that it's renewed for the following year, but we're also looking at a SAMHSA uh, funding source that we're gonna be putting an application for. So we're continuing to look. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Councillor Perry. Well, thank you. Um, again, I want to reiterate um, all of my excitement and enthusiasm for this department. I actually happen to be back in my home of DC and it is a shining example of over-policing. And I'm really looking forward to Northampton being a model for our surrounding communities and for our own community. Um, with that being said, I have two questions. One is about training. And I saw there was 150 plus hours. And I was wondering if that training will also be offered to other departments, whether it's police and stuff or, okay. I see your head's nodding, so we don't even have to go into that. That's excellent. Um, and and the, the second part then was a question about uh, outreach. I, I heard you guys talk about community days when uh, interim director Sean Donovan was around. He and I really connected on the community aspect. You know, I, I pride myself as a, a, a man among the people and I, you know, I love throwing events. So I was wondering what you guys had in, in mind for some community outreach. So I'll, I'm going to take the first part about training. So as you all saw our, our heads nod, yes, we are incorporating our training and going to be making certain parts of the training available to community, to um, collaborating agencies. We are going to get these training as widespread as we can. And an example of this is we are doing a foundation's training in interrupter racism. And with the support of our mayor, we're actually rolling this out to all municipal employees and we're hoping to extend it to boards and committees as well, because we feel it's so important that everyone have this foundation in, um, in, in understanding how we got to where we are. So training is important and we don't want to, we don't want to work in a vacuum. We want to make sure that we are teaching and educating as we are all learning. And then I'm going to let Michelle or Chris, Michelle's going to come on. Yeah, you know, I am so glad that you asked this question, Councillor Perry, and I've missed seeing you. I'd love to get out and uh, take a walk with you and just uh, spring in Northampton. But I spent about an hour this afternoon in um, Pulaski Park and 
all I could do is imagine us constantly being embedded within the community landscape, available, ready, visible. Um, we're looking at buying two vans for the DCC. We've uh, settled on having two teams. And of those two teams, we plan to be at community events, supporting all sorts of different um, city-sponsored and community-led um, needs. As much as we're invited, we hope to be there. Um, but I also wanted to mention, as far as community events go, we had really uh, terrific responses to a lot of the different initiatives that we had. And we were averaging about one significant event sponsored by the DCC a month. And they were really strate strategic in the sense where Sean had brought some lovely concepts in the ways that we could introduce some of the subject matter that we would be training the CCRT team on to the greater community and bringing the community experts you know, to the forefront to deliver a lot of that information through arts and humanities and culture. And I think one of the things we'd really like to continue doing is hosting subject matter experts. We've asked, um, those at the academy that anyone reaches out to them on behalf of special um, social ways that we can connect and introduce new subject matter as well as community learning that can be facilitated or we can contribute to and as well be part of the process because um, we want to really be on a journey with the community and not feel like we're you know in any way shape or form doing more than um, bringing this subject matter so that we can develop the implementation for it and readiness um, together. It's definitely a joint project. The last thing I wanted to say is we have the Power of Truths coming up that we're supporting from the DCC, which is really exciting. And um, one of our uh, DHHS divisions, the Northampton Prevention Coalition, is participating. But there's been a lot of interdisciplinary work happening with the DCC and the DHHS, which has been really, really lovely. The staff understand the goals of the DCC, and so they are able to make those connections to their work in health and human services and get the message and the um, connections made with other providers that we might not have typically intersected with, like prevention and the schools and the youth voice. So very excited um, and unlimited opportunities for outreach. We'll be there. You tell us where to be. <laughs> thank you very much. I think that answers my question. Hey, thank you. Um, the chair, so I'll take a, a, a turn. Um, I have so many questions, but I will also limit myself. One, um, I think that that I've heard come up quite a bit uh, from members of the public and, and that I didn't hear you touch on yet is about an advisory board. Um, and if if you, if you have plans for that that are shareable, if, if you could share that with us, that would be great. So part of the um, listening sessions and the discussion that garnering the community voice has opened the door for was also for people that wanted to volunteer or contribute towards a DCC advisory group. Um, we would like to engage the advisory group in some way of the hiring process for the community care responders too. There's a lot of ways the advisory group, we hope to be very dynamic and helpful. So um, what we expect is to have a list of names that are gonna be coming to us after the different forms of all of the um, uh, translation, transcribing uh, comes back to us that happened from last week. And once those names are um, put together by the partner, then we're going to reach out and get some confirmations for people and hold that first group. I'm hoping by the end of April or early May is what we've been told by our provider, the expert provider that did this work for us in the community. So will that be um, a structured city board or commission with a certain number of members and an, an intended makeup and, and that sort of thing? As part of the peer participatory process, this will be a consensus group that will be giving feedback, but they will not be a decision-making body. So they will be contributing to important critical vision, mission, goals, helping to devise statements and norms and group agreements, but it would not be a decision-making group that would be sanctioned by the city, so to speak. It would be on behalf of the DCC and a volunteer group. Okay. Is it a standing committee? Like there, you'll always shoot for nine members on it, or will it be sort of a rotating as people come in with interest? 
You know, that's a good question. I think what we're trying to do is make it ex as accessible as possible. So we're going to assess what people's willingness and availability is, um, how often and regularly they're willing to meet, um, how we need to make accessibility very intentional. So hybrid meetings, different times of day, translation, all sorts of pieces. So there'll be a lot more details on that to come. What I'm hoping is to get a lot more information from those um, transcriptions of the interviews that just concluded, because a lot of feedback on that um, exact question was coming from individuals in the community voice themselves and what they would like to see. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, the other, I guess the other significant question I have, and, and Commissioner O'Leary, I can't get over your dog, so and, and right there, but also adorable. Um, the the other question I had was you touched on space being in the um, former Smithsonian restaurant. Um, and is that like a stopgap until the resilience hub is ready? Because what you were describing is what I was picturing as a resilience hub. Okay. Yes, very short term, but one of the things we knew in wanting to get the program going and launched was definitely to have a brick and mortar where people could come, walk in, get support, and we could as well triage. So it's a short term space in lieu of when we get more news about the church coming soon, which we're very excited. Okay. And just a, a thought I'll add, Kristen, to the tea time idea. I, I'm sure you're you're light years ahead, but um, can be really nice to partner with somebody who's already so well known in the community. So if they're joining you plus this other person who's very active in peer support or whatever it is, um, might be a really cool way to engage with with people um, using you know relying on the the trusted connections of of other people too. Um, and I see other counselors here, um, but I, I haven't seen hands. But I just want to. Um, give counselors Jarrett Moulton and Mayori a chance if, if you do want to engage in the conversation, you're, you're more than welcome to. No pressure though. Okay, city services committee members, do you have other questions or thoughts that you'd like to ask of our, yes, Councilor Gore. Um, I'm on the transportation and parking commission and I heard a public comment about like uh, traffic, like um, members of the C CRT doing like traffic kind of stops and things like that instead of the police. Is that something you've thought about? I wouldn't say that is something we've thought about or we've discussed. Um, and so far across the country, none of the models that we've brought in do traffic enforcement. They often will do um, collaborative trauma responses if there's been accidents or any sort of um, need for assistance. There are actually even policies in some states that don't allow for um, co-responders or community responders that are like the CCRT to actually do anything in a roadway, um, which I didn't even know there was, you know, policies and, and laws regarding that. And as a matter of fact, those calls that come into dispatch, um, when there's someone in a public roadway, their community response teams aren't allowed to actually take those calls. And I'm not saying that's the case for Northampton, um, but there are a lot of policies. There's a lot of things we need to look at and find out what the correct responses should be for community responders and where we're gonna be the most effective at helping support people. And I can understand there's probably a call for something like that, thinking about our social justice and equitable and trauma-informed practices. Um, but at this time, there hasn't been any discussion about anything relating to traffic enforcement or a role the CCRT would play with that. We'd like to hear more about why people are asking those questions, though, always willing to listen. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, counselors, any, any final thoughts or questions for our DHHS team? Hey. Um, Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, you're, it's been a, a hotly requested update and I, I really appreciate your time and, and the work um, that you've put into this and clearly the thoughtfulness um, you know, that, that you're going about your work with. And I, and I know that 
this kind of division um, is something that we wanted yesterday, um, three years ago. And to do work like this really well requires an awful lot of diligence and planning and care. And I can see that reflected in your work. So I, I appreciate that. Um, and I uh, just want to give you one final chance if there's something we didn't ask or a thought you you had that you're like, ah, I want to share this thing um, before we we say goodbye and let you go about your evening. Okay. I, I just want to say one thing. Yeah. Thank you to everyone here on City Council. Um, part of the reminiscing of how we got here and doing this well and thoughtfully for the city, we take this as an extremely serious responsibility and are putting all of the diligence into that work. And we felt very supported and the community has been very engaged. So I just want to say thank you. It's been a lot of rigor, but it feels so meaningful and so supported by the city. So we're really glad that we can be in the position to do the work. So thank you. Well said, Michelle. Michelle, thank you all very much for having us here tonight and listening and providing us your thoughts and input. Super important that uh, we're all moving together, forward together. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, City Services Committee, we just have one appointment um, that we need to handle um, before Laura, you can get a hopefully a quick break before the finance committee. Um, so uh, I always feel so jarring these transitions, but here we are. Um, so that brings us to item six, items referred to committee, um, 23.276, the appointment of the Arts Council um, that was referred to city services on March 16th um, of Ronald Smith um, uh, to fill a vacancy. And um, I knew how much, uh, everybody had on their plate. So I, I wanted to talk to Mr. Smith, so I did. Um, and he and I had a, a great conversation. Um, he is a music um, teacher and a working performer. Um, he's a teacher at Northfield Mount Herman, Herman um, and a, a regular performer out in the community. And um, the way he sort of described his interest in the Arts Council is always sort of known it's there um, and known that there were people doing the work. He's performed at first night, um, but he sort of described it as being kind of on the outside looking in and he wants to be on the inside of the community and of the art scene and felt like um, joining the Arts Council may be an opportunity um, you know, to take that step. And it was really interesting because one of the questions I asked him was if he'd been to any Arts Council meetings yet. And he was like, huh, no, that hadn't really occurred to me. And only saying that as we discuss sort of some of the barriers or thoughts um, you know, towards service that I, I that's a, a step that um, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, and, and yet there was still kind of um, not that knowledge yet that it was open and, and he could and should join. Uh, but that being said, he did have a conversation with Brian Foote um, about the, the council and the work they do. He's very open to kind of, um, you know, different committees and, and different options um, for the work. And, um, you know, his real interest is kind of how he can be helpful and serve the arts community in Northampton. Um, so with that, I move a positive recommendation of Ronald Smith to the Arts Council. I'll second that. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Perry, you can't unmute. No, I think Mary Ann was trying to say second. I saw her. Oh, oh. Councillor Labarge, you are muted. Sorry. <laughs> That means Councilor Gore gets it, um, but you were you were muted. Uh, can you? Oh, you can't unmute. Okay, you're a co-host now. Can you unmute now? Well, oh. Yep, got it. Excellent. All right, great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so the, the motion was made by me, seconded by Councilor Gore. Is there any discussion on this appointment? No. Okay. Then Laura, if you could do a roll call, please. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Perry. Yes. Okay, so that, that motion, that um, positive recommendation passes four to nothing, um, which brings us up to item seven, new business. <coughs> okay, um, and then item eight, uh, if anyone would like to make a motion. Motion to adjourn. Second it. Okay, motion to adjourn made by Councillor Perry, seconded by Councillor Labarge. Laura, if you could do a roll call. 
Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Perry. Yes. Great. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. Laura, Laura thanks for 